One of the great uh, horrible, terrible challenges facing neuroscience at the moment is that because it's maybe becoming a sort of trendy area, lots of people are trying to jump on the bandwagon. So for instance, if you type into Google neuroscience and education, you'll get lots of hits, and most of them are junk. Okay? But unfortunately, they don't come with a little label attached saying this is junk. You know, uh, and you know, in between them, some saying, you know, oh, this is actually work done by a really, really respected researcher who's done really good stuff. So, and, and this, if you search for books on dyslexia, this is a particularly salient example of that. So there's tons of books on dyslexia, and lots of them are course, things like, you know, how my kid overcame dyslexia, you know, the subtitle should be sample size of one, your results may vary. Um, or, you know, the miracle diet to cure dyslexia, or I don't know, you know, how you can cure dyslexia by eating organic food, or, you know, all this kind of stuff, okay? But if, and if you ever know anyone who says, hey, you know, I have a kid, or I have dyslexia, or I know someone with dyslexia, what's a good book to read that actually, you know, is based on solid science and which gives a good overview of what's going on with dyslexia, what some of the treatment options are, I definitely recommend this one by Sally Sherwood, Overcoming Dyslexia. Um, uh, so she's, yes, she's done important imaging work. And, uh, and this is a sort of summary of the sort of results that she's found, she and her colleagues. There's a whole group at Yale. Um, also related to people at Haskins Labs, which is a big speech lab. Um, so here are some, we've talked about these areas a little bit before. Here are some classical language areas. So here's Broca's area. Uh, these are on the left hemisphere in almost all people. Uh, this is very important for production of speech, but also for lots of other aspects of language. That's a good example, by the way, of an area with multiple functions. Okay? I mean, that's true for actually all of these areas. This is Wernicke's area, which is very important for the perception and understanding of speech, and also lots of other things. Um, and this is a slightly more controversial area, uh, which is often referred to as the visual word form area, that is particularly active if people are reading letters on a screen uh, or on a, on a page. Um, and as you can probably guess, one of the reasons why it's controversial is, is it really <coughs> just for visual word forms, or is it actually for, you know, forms and object perception in general, and just an omix of which words are one of many? And that's, that's an active debate. Um, as you can probably guess, I'm sort of inclined to believe that it might be involved in a lot of things with, with words being a sort of, you know, one of its kind of top functions, but not like it, it doesn't mean it's a, an area for words. But that, that's the, whether you, you know, whatever your views are on that doesn't actually matter. The key, the key result is that normal readers or non-impaired readers have activation in all of these regions when they're reading. Whereas if someone's dyslexic, they tend to have a lot less activation, especially in uh, these rear areas. And they might even have more activation in this frontal area. So it seems that the, whatever's going on here and here, they don't seem to have enough of it. Uh, you know, so processing of words, processing of the meaning of words, and some kind of maybe compensatory stuff, maybe this area has to work extra hard, and there's actually uh, some other areas uh, in the right hemisphere that may be involved in that too. So here's, a, you know, an illustration of an actual scan. This is what's, you know, again from their nice website, you know, um, showing uh, not just these areas, but also kind of what it might look like in a real scan. and. Um, and it also, you probably can't see this text, but it says here, Broca's area, inferior frontal gyrus, articulation or word analysis. That's actually kind of interesting right there because our, you know, this area was first defined for articulation, production of speech, right? This person, the patient who came to the neurologist Broca could only say the word tan, okay? All he could say was tan, but he could understand speech. So we imagine how frustrating that would be. Um, uh, so people originally thought, oh, well, this is an area for speech articulation, you know, making your mouth make the right movements to, you know, spit speech out. But now it says, you know, articulation and word analysis. Well, whatever word analysis is, and it obviously involves a lot of things, is this sort of phonological awareness, hearing that words are broken up into parts. It involves a lot more than, it's definitely not the same thing as just making words come out of your mouth, right? It involves sort of processing and analyzing the parts that they're made out of. So it has a perceptual aspect as well as this motor articulatory aspect. 
parietotemporal or you know, Wernicke's plus angular gyrus, other areas, word analysis as well. Now, whatever word analysis is going on here is, may or may not be the same as what's going on here, but there's probably strong connections. And there's literally a strong connection called the arcua fasciculus between these two areas, and we'll get to that in a minute. Um, and here's uh, occipitotemporal word form, probably objects as well, more generally than just words. It might be words, it might be objects that you see a lot, for instance, okay, because we see a lot of words. Um, and then just to kind of give the last slide of the sort of classical and very respected and definitely right, but maybe not the whole story uh, view from, uh, from more slides from Sally Shewitz. So what goes wrong over the course of development? Well, it seems that maybe this visual word form area maybe doesn't form, and that some extra systems sort of get roped in instead to try and compensate. So instead of having all of this activation sort of in these language and word form areas at the back of the left hemisphere, you might get extra activation for the front, extra activation in the right hemisphere. So this is your kind of atypical, this is the typical pattern of reading-related activation, and this is your sort of atypical pattern of activation. Okay, with kind of extra compensatory stuff happening. So, um, I have a quick question. Yes, yes. This is, this made me think of this question, so this question isn't directly related to this. That's fine, um, no, please. Fine so, uh, you know, I imagine a lot of this higher higher cognition stuff to be very dis diffuse and not anywhere near modulatory. This is just my own belief. No, yeah, no, that's a very so reasonable thing. How would an fMRI detect something that's so diffuse? Okay, well, that's a very, very good question. So, in fact, this is, uh, so this is one of the reasons, I mean, I'm going to give you a sort of slightly partisan answer here, but this is one of the reasons why uh, a multivoxel uh, pattern-based approach can be particularly helpful. Okay? Because in a standard analysis, a standard kind of, you know, where do we get the strongest activation intensity analysis, uh, you know, usually we're doing some sort of thresholding, so, well, pretty much always doing some kind of, in fact, we're exploring the effects of different thresholds uh, in one of the computer practicals with Dan recently. So what you noticed it will have noticed is that if you have a low threshold, you know, it kind of looks like huge swathes of cortex are all active. But then if you crank up the threshold enough, then you can get a nice kind of clean looking island of activation, which is usually what you see in the pictures. Okay? And it's not unreasonable to crank up the active the threshold. It's not just to make everything look clean, it's because probably a lot of this stuff that only passes a low statistical threshold is, is probably just noise, but it might not. Okay. So if you have, so 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 a standard analysis is very good at detecting a small number of voxels that become very highly and reliably active for the task. But what if you have something, as you very rightly point out, this is a very good question. And by the way, if you have a question that you kind of feel like, ah, this is probably not a very good question, it probably is a good question. Okay, I'm not making this up. This is an area where even the most basic questions, I know I said this before, uh, are unknown. Everything's very open. You know, a question that seems to ask something that quote unquote basic is maybe getting to something very important. Okay, so what if instead of having uh, a small number of voxels that become very intensely and reliably active, you have a large number of voxels that sort of do something, right? So, uh, well, the only way you can tell that is by somehow pooling the information across a large number of voxels. But just, you know, the simplest way of pooling is just averaging their activation together. But they're, if they're all only weakly active, then the average is just going to be, you know, weekly, a weak activation as well. And so it's just going to, you know, it's not going to look like anything significant. But there might be something important happening in the pattern distributed across many voxels that's highly informative, but which you're not seeing by uh, looking at the average in activation intensity. So the, you know, I, I sort of ages ago gave the example of telling the difference between the letter M and the letter W. Okay, so you know, they're both in some ways, compared to say a letter like I, right, they're both quite spread out diffuse letters. Right? You know, you can't just look at, you know, local ink density and just figure out whether something's an M or a W in the same way as you could figure out that, you know, is there a letter I on the page here where you do have this nice little kind of tight the line of activation, okay, a line of ink. Okay? <coughs> so the only way you can tell the difference is by is by uh, looking at the pattern across a fairly big chunk of uh, of paper. I mean, they're, you know, they're not very big letters, but if you just um, if you say is there any single point 
you know, if you looked on a monitor and you look pixel by pixel, is there any single pixel that will tell me whether this thing is an M or a W? No, there isn't. The only way you can tell is by looking across multiple pixels at once. And it's kind of like that with patterns too. So, so, uh, so this is the sort you know the, the, these analyses that I'm showing here are using kind of a standard, just you know where where do we have the most intense activation general linear model analysis? And these were done you know in the 90s and early 2000s, so that's entirely reasonable. Um, and they produce actually quite important results. So the, you know there really is a difference in activation intensity in these fairly kind of discrete little islands. Okay? But there's almost certainly lots of other stuff going on too. And in fact, I'm going to show you in the in the in the Heftedal paper, the PNAS paper, they explicitly look at that. So we'll see that in a little bit. Does that sort of answer the question? Um, okay. So this is the kind of standard view, which is quite informative. But there's lots of things that it doesn't tell us. So it doesn't tell us, for instance, anything about representations. It doesn't tell us, you know, how are the words, this very interesting question of, you know, might there be good representations that are sort of hard to get to, or might there be bad representations? There's no, you can't even really begin to answer that question by just saying, well, you've got more activation here or less activation there. You know, because it's definitely not the case that more activation means a better representation, right? Uh, representation is something that you know conveys information about the world. It's not just you know how how much oxygen is getting pumped there. So uh, so here's a sort of cartoon of of, of why this is uh, something where imaging might be useful. So we've got two kids and they're both struggling to read and they look incredibly similar. From the outside, all you can tell is they're just doing badly on their tests. Um, but is this a problem of representations or not? And so, from behavior, by, de by definition, you know, I've sort of set this up so that by definition, these kids look exactly the same. They both score equally badly on their reading scores. So, could there be differences on the inside? Um, so, uh, so, here's a kid who, from the outside, looks just the same as this other kid. But this kid has perfectly good representations but there's some problem accessing them. So the type of remediation this kid will need would be something that helps them to access the representation. So it's not clearly clear what that remediation would be, but that's a separate question. Okay. Here's a different kid who looks completely the same from the outside. This kid's representations actually are poorly developed, but they're perfectly accessible. But you know, from the outside, whether you have good representations that you, can, you can't access or bad representations that you can access, they're both going to both those scenarios are going to give you trouble reading. Okay? And this is not just specific to reading. This could be true in many, many aspects of life. This is sometimes called a distinction in, in language. It's sometimes called a distinction between competence and performance. Okay? So someone could do badly on something for lots of different reasons. You can have a performance problem. It doesn't necessarily mean that their ability to represent the key information is what's causing that performance problem. It might be a problem with attention or motivation or accessing representations or being able to sit still in the chair or understanding what the task is. It might be all kinds of things. Okay, so this kid who actually does have poor representations would, um, would need a representation, uh, remediation to improve those representations. So from the outside, they look completely the same, but inside something very different is going on and that has consequences. It has consequences for how to help. And so here's an example. This is something that I actually kind of cooked up a while ago. This is not exactly what they do in the uh, in the science paper, but, uh, but this was a sort of study that I wanted to do, but obviously I never got to do it. But, um, but this is a sort of illustration. So suppose you have a bunch of different words that um, differ in, say, just a single dimension, like you know the, the consonant at the beginning changes. I use actually non-words here, but just to kind of keep meaning out of it, like said, cared, bed. Or they might differ in the vowel. The, the, the Burt's paper treats these two things as different. I'll show in a minute. Uh, like kick, tag, and cub, uh, or they might differ, you know, by more than one dimension. So they might have a different consonant and a different vowel, or they might differ in everything. So the prediction would be, um, if you're a normal reader, this prediction turns out to be wrong, by the way, probably if you believe the the Burt's paper. Okay, but this is the prediction, um, and it's fine making a prediction that's wrong. So I would I would encourage you in your project if you if you say um, you know, if you say, you know, we'd like to ask this question, if you can make a little graph, I sort of showed some other examples from other papers before, that says, 
if this prediction is right, then we'll expect this. And if this prediction is wrong, then we'll expect this. That's great. That's very clear and wonderful if you can actually do that. It, it's not always possible to do that, but it's worth trying. Um, so if, you, if someone's brain is really representing the phonological similarity of different words, that, which is a very important thing to represent in order to learn how to read, uh, then, um, then if you have words, or non-words in this case, that differ in one phonological unit, then they should be not very dissimilar. They should be quite similar to each other. If they differ in two units, they should be <coughs> more dissimilar, and then even more dissimilar if they differ in three units. Okay, so there should be some relation between the struck the stimulus relationships, and in this case, how many phonological units they have in common, and the representations. And the, the, the more different they are in the world, the more different they should be in the brain representations. And this is not going to be, this is almost certainly not going to be, you know, greater, act, greater intensity of activation. There's really no reason why, you know, the word, you know, pig should make more activation than the word pog or something, right? Okay, but it's going to be the, the similarity relations between those activations. And so, the hypothesis, so this hypothesis that's shown in this figure, this is just one I made up, uh, is that in someone who's dyslexic, they should actually, that, that relationship should be broken. So it doesn't matter how, how uh, similar or dissimilar the, the words are in terms of their shared phonological units, the brain is going to say, hey, they're all about more or less the same. Okay, so if your brain is failing to respond to with greater neural dissimilarity to greater phonological dissimilarity, then that might be a bad kind of representation to have. So, um, so anyway, so, so uh, this is actually a, uh, a figure from a, one of my old rejected grant proposals. But, um, but anyway, so these other people came up with, but they didn't just do this idea, but they actually asked a very interesting supplementary question that I didn't even think of asking. So, so I'm, I'm uh, so I can't claim any, uh, anything for that. So this is, this is a really nice paper, but they do kind of overuse abbreviations and acronyms in it, in my opinion. So let me just spend a little bit of time explaining what, <clears throat> what this, this, all of these different letters in this figure mean. OK, so N, I mean, it's not that bad, actually. So NR means normal readers. DR means dyslexic readers. Okay. PACL means primary auditory cortex left. Okay. PACL means primary auditory cortex right. STGL means superior temporal gyrus left, right. Uh, STG superior, superior temporal gyrus right. Okay. So, but if you do make a figure in your project, or in fact in any other paper that you ever present to anyone, try not to make it such that no one can make head or tail of the figure until they go up and look up what lots of lots of acronyms mean. Okay. Even if, and it's difficult because. You know, these authors probably didn't for one minute think, oh, no one's going to know what PACL means because we've been talking about PACL for weeks and months and, you know, we all know what it means and you kind of forget other people might know what it means. Okay. So, so these slightly different shades of gray correspond to their different conditions. Okay. So it's a great study, maybe not the clearest figure in the world. Okay. So, um, but luckily they're always organized in the same order. So this is very similar to what I showed in the last slide. It's just slightly different. Um, so the dark one, the leftmost bars, is when things, when the words are phonetically identical, the exact same word. And what's being plotted here is the neural similarity. Uh, when you go over one bar and it's slightly lighter gray, uh, it's when they're very similar words, but they differ only by one constant. I think it's the initial constant. Okay. So you know. Um, dog versus uh, cock, or something like that. Okay. Uh, when it's uh, slightly lighter gray, they've got the same initial consonant, but the vowel in the middle is different. So, you know, dog versus dick. Uh, and then the lightest one of all on the far right-hand side is when the consonant and the vowel are both different. So, so as you go uh, from left to right, you've got Phonologically exactly the same, slightly different, a bit more different if you think that having a different vowel is more different, and even more different. Okay? So, so uh, a brain which actually 
represents these differences where the neural similarity sort of tracks the similarity in the stimuli should be like highly similar for the identical words, a bit less similar for the ones that are different their consonant, maybe a bit less similar still for the ones that are different the vowel, and even less similar for the ones that differ in consonant and vowel. So you should see a sort of like decreasing trend like this. And look what you get. You get a sort of decreasing trend. And here's, you know, in the primary auditory cortex, that's actually kind of interesting in itself because one might expect that primary auditory cortex wouldn't actually uh, respond to these sort of aspects of words. I was having an interesting discussion just earlier today with two of you guys about, uh, you know, what's a lower level area and a higher level area? Okay, or what's a lower level function and a higher level function? These can actually be quite difficult terms to deal with because, you know, you would think that a primary auditory cortex, which is like the first part of cortex that see, you know, signals come in, they go from your cochlea to your middle of the neck, medial to the nucleus up to your um, auditory cortex. That's the first bit of cortex they hit, right? That's kind of pretty primary, low level auditory stuff. And yet, it seems to be the similarity patterns there seem to be responding to this quite high level feature of how phonetically similar words are. Right? That's actually a little bit surprising. Um, but, uh, but what's really important, the superior temporalis has much, you know, has a, it's a bigger area and it has more sort of higher level stuff going on it, you know, as you go further backwards and further forwards. Um, but this just sort of illustrates that a quote unquote high level functions such as something to do with reading or uh, hearing different sounds, parts of words, um, can actually be present in a low level area. Now does that mean that the computation was done in the area or was it maybe done in a higher area and sort of fed back into the, the answers were fed back into that lower level area? That This study in itself can't tell you that. That's a very interesting question. It's kind of hard to ask that question, answer that question actually. But the crucial point is this. Okay, So if if the brain is really re representing different levels of phonetic similarity, <coughs> probably should call it phonological similarity, uh, then you should get these sort of decreasing functions. The lines should be going down like this. Okay? And what you can see from these graphs is that the lines are kind of going down like that, or the, the pattern of bar heights. And it does that just as much in the DR, the, you know, the acronym soup here, the dyslexic readers as in the normal readers. Okay, so line going down, line going down, going down, going down, going down. So all of these regions, whether you're a normal reader or a dyslexic reader, are all responding to this difference in uh, the phonological similarity of the words. And that's kind of surprising because that, that's the part where, where it says intact representations. Right? You know, or in other words, that this prediction, which I, you know, this is not from the paper, this was like, it's my own slide, this prediction is wrong, okay, according to their data. Okay? So in fact, it's not the case that, you know, normal readers look like this, that, this is sort of their graph upside down, actually. Okay, it's not the case that their graph, that, you know, normal readers have greater dissimilarity as you have increased phonological dissimilarity, greater neural dissimilarity, and that dyslexic readers, it's sort of flat. In fact, it looks like whether you're a normal reader or a dyslexic reader, you have greater similarity, with, greater neural similarity with greater phonological similarity. Intact representations. So that's kind of interesting and surprising, and no one had actually shown that before, so that, you know, that's a big reason why I got into science. But then you have this question, well, hang on a minute. These are people who have trouble reading. So there's got to be something that's different, right? There's got to be some problem. I mean, you know, just because there's a problem doesn't mean you can pick it up neurally, but it would be nice if we could pick it up. So, you know, saying that you have intact representations is all well and good, but really shouldn't it be the case that something is, is wrong? And so that's what they say, intact but less accessible representations. Now, last week we were talking about functional connectivity, right? So the correlation between different areas. So that's what they did. They said, okay, well, maybe, maybe these different regions, which in and of themselves are representing the, 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 the stimuli just fine, maybe they're not talking to each other very well, right? So they're not, they're not you know, there's a problem with accessing these representations. 
So, you know, here's another example of this. It's not really the clearest figure in the world, but let me kind of talk you through it a bit, okay? So here, and this, these, these are definitely too small for you to see. This is, I can't even see it actually, and I'm right up here. Um, these are, uh, you know, lots of different um, brain areas. So the, the areas shown primarily by these dots up here. Um, and um, uh, the, the color chart is uh, red is a strong connection and blue is a, a weak connection. Okay? And so, you know, here's normal readers and here's dyslexic readers. And you know, if you just eyeball these, you, you can't really see that much of a difference between them, right? You know, lots of regions seem to be quite strongly connected with each other, and regions look to be kind of strike quite strongly connected with each other. There's lots of red, in other words. There's lots of red here, even in the dyslexic regions. So you know, just eyeballing these two things doesn't tell you much. But then if you say, aha, well, what about the difference between the normal readers and the dyslexic readers? And that's here. And then you get a couple of a couple of connections which are particularly strongly different in the normal, uh, you know, particularly much stronger in the normal readers than in the dyslexic readers. And the very interesting one, and in fact the strongest, the biggest difference that came out, was a connection between the uh, left inferior frontal gyrus and the left superior temporal gyrus. So do you remember? Um, okay, in other words, here and here. Okay. So remember I was saying that you know, these are like two crucial speech and language areas. So this is Broca's area, this is Wernicke's area. I mean, their superior temporal gyrus area actually covered a broader area than that. And there's the anatomically a strong connection between these called the arcuophysiscalus. So um, it, an interesting hypothesis is maybe there's something wrong with that connection, right? If these two areas are not really talking well with each other, then uh, then that would be you know, quite likely to cause you some reading and language problems. And so when they, when they looked at where was the biggest difference uh, between, uh, between the interregional functional connectivity in the normal readers and the dyslexic readers, the biggest difference, in fact, turned out to be the, uh, the connection between those two regions, the left inferior frontal gyrus and the left superior temporal gyrus. So, uh, so that's kind of a nice result, right? That suggests that um, that's where they get the second part of their title, right? Intact but less accessible representations in adults with dyslexia. Okay, so these, e these each of these regions seems to have an okay representation going on because they they they're both responding. To um, well, this this graph they, they they show multiple regions in this graph. Actually, I just chopped off the top bit of it. Uh, but this graph doesn't show those two exact regions, but those two regions it just shows a superior temporal one. Um, but those two regions both had this sort of decreasing function of, you know, the greater the neural similarity, the greater the phonological similarity. But then, but they don't seem to be talking to each other. And um, this is kind of another illustration of. Uh, what makes a data result believable or not believable. And you know, there's no very clear lines here. So they looked at the connections between lots of different areas, and they did the right kind of statistical correction to deal with the fact they were doing lots of comparisons. And it turned out that the region with the biggest difference was one that made a lot of sense. Okay? And you know, how do you quantify that something makes sense? Well, does it fit with kind of what we already know? So in a sense, this really suggests either that they were lucky or that they're really hitting on something true here because of all the different possible pairwise connections between different regions that might have come out as the one with showing the strongest difference, the one that did come out showing the strongest difference between normal and dyslexic regions was one which on completely independent anatomical grounds we would think is likely to be important for reading. Yeah. yeah. So two questions actually. Mm. So it looks like there's one more than one mm -hmm, mm -hmm. strong correlation. Yeah, there's another one here. I'd have to check and see. If they talk about this, but what is? I'd, ha I'd have to pull up the paper and see what it is. This one's the strongest. Actually, look, uh, hang on a minute. This text is too small for me to see right now. I'd have to pull up the paper. Yeah, but there is another one as well. And in fact, so clearly I'm presenting, and you know I'm just presenting the story as they tell it. This is a little bit of a simplification. So. 
the, the cleanest possible result would be that everything was basically exactly the same except for this one region. But in fact, they do find a couple of other regions whose connectivity is, is, is fairly different, one of which even reaches significance, and I would have to see what that is. I think that's one which sort of functionally makes sense too, but it's not quite mm -hmm. as good. And then this here actually is a relation between uh, the neural measure and the behavioral measure. So this is a sort of another piece of uh, supporting evidence. So you won't be able to read this from the text, but this says uh, phonological um, discrimination score. So this is a behavioral measure, and this is functional connectivity between these two regions, the sort of Broca's and Wernicke's type area. And they find that, uh, let's see, this is reaction time. So uh, a, a, high, a high reaction time means they, did, they were doing badly. Okay, so you might say, so you would predict, okay, that the, the stronger the connection between these two areas, the better <coughs> people would be at the task, uh, and in fact, that's what they find. So this is a sort of another piece of corroborating evidence that there may be something real going on here. They tie it with behavior. So this is just a nice, you know, this is kind of a nice result in a few different ways. Uh, it relates, uh, it measures, it, pull, it tries to, no, this is definitely not the end of the story. There's, there's all kinds of ways in which you know, this study could lead to future work, which is, of course, a good thing. Uh, um, but it, it asks this very, very difficult question that hadn't really been looked at properly before. Of how can you tell the difference between having a good representation that you can't get at versus not having a good representation? And, and I would be very difficult to address. I, don't, I can't say it would be impossible. It would be very difficult to address that with a purely behavioral measure. Because you, you know, how are you supposed to tell? Maybe with sufficiently clever tasks you could do it, but it's not, let's just say it's not clear that you could do it with behavioral measure. So here's a nice example where imaging is really maybe providing something extra, because people would look the same from the outside and different on the inside. It ties, uh, so it measures, it has a couple of different measures. It looks at connectivity. The connectivity, connectivity difference that they find, lucky for them, sort of makes sense, sort of fits with what we know anatomically about the connections, and it actually relates to behavioral performance as well. So, so there's multiple threads coming together suggesting that you know, there may be something real going on. But this is, you know, but this is cognitive neuroscience. I mean, uh, we won't have really great confidence that something real is going on until other people find a similar result independently. And because this is a big, splashy paper and came out in science, it's quite likely that other people are going to try and find and look for the same kind of result, and we'll find out whether they find it or not. Uh, so, but, but this is certainly promising. Uh, so, that's a, so that's an illustration of, uh, of that. So, um, you know, we only have five minutes left, so I think I'm going to save uh, talking about the, the Heftedal paper uh, a little bit for uh, Thursday, and we'll talk about some other stuff then too. But, um, but the, the thing that I really like about both these papers is they sort, of in, they sort of illustrate the ways in which imaging can earn its keep. Okay? So I'm not going to talk right now about exactly what these people did, but like, you know, just the title is kind of instructive in itself. Neural systems predicting long-term outcome in dyslexia. Okay? And, um, well, I'm just going to give you a little peek. Okay. So uh, the, the punchline is, brain measures, these are just some quotes from their abstract, brain measures that predict future behavioral outcomes, neuroprognosis, yeah, you see, when, they have, when you have real prediction, you often call it prognosis, okay, um, may be more accurate in some cases than available behavioral measures. Okay. And there's really not very many papers that do that. Okay. So, um, you know, it, I, I keep on saying an interesting test for whether imaging is worth its keep is, can you get something over and above what you can get from behavior? That's easy to say, but really hard to do. I mean, like many things in life. Because you can get so much from behavior. You can get lots of it. People understood lots and lots about dyslexia just from behavioral tests. I mean, they didn't understand enough, and we still don't understand enough. It's not the case that we can just take dyslexics and, you know, get make them all read better. In fact, actually, existing therapies kind of work for some people and don't work for other people, and no one really quite understands why. So whatever it is that we understand, we've got a little bit of an understanding, but not enough. And the question is, okay, well, we, and we almost certainly have not exhausted the beyond, definitely have not exhausted the understanding that you can get just from behavior, but it's very reasonable to expect, well, 
there's got to be something going on with their internal representations, and we do actually have the ability now to look at, to some degree, people's representations. There should be, if there's internal stuff brewing that maybe won't manifest itself until later in behavior, later in development, then if we, if we follow kids over time, we ought to maybe, by looking inside their head, be able to get some advanced notice, early diagnosis, early predictive power of these problems that are brewing, which we might not see until you know a couple of years down the line. That's what these people were doing. They're following for two novels. And something like reading is particularly important for that because you know a kid doesn't really start learning to read much until they're you know say four, five, six years old. But there might be stuff. There might be you know there's very very important language development happening in their head when they're six months old, when they're a year old, when they're two years old, way before reading has even begun. So. It's generally the case, if you want to try and fix something, catch it early. Right? That's true for you know, cancer, that's true for learning disabilities, that's true for everything. Okay? Um, so you know, if you have to wait till something bubbles out to the outside as a problem with reading, a kid might be seven, eight, nine years old before anyone notices that they're falling behind in their reading. And it might, it's not too late, but it's a lot later than it would be if you started giving them some remediation when they were four. Okay? So, if you can look on the inside of the head before stuff is even, could even in principle bubble out on the outside into behavior, then that could be very valuable for early diagnosis and starting early treatment. So that's kind of the hope. And, um, and I think that that is, you know, I and other people, and you know, obviously these people have shown nicely illustrating that, think that that's one of the ways in which imaging could really potentially be valuable, right? Going in above, over and above, just giving you pretty pictures, giving you extra pre, pre uh, predictive and diagnostic power. And also, you can ask these interesting um, uh, interesting representational questions of, uh, you know, there's something going on in the world, the stimuli becoming more or less similar. Is the brain, in its neural similarities, tracking that? Do the neural similarities increase as the stimuli become more similar? Do they decrease as the stimuli become less similar? If that is happening, then those are probably useful neural representations. Now, then the question of how those representations are being used, how they're being read out, how they're being accessed is still a separate question. And so that's one of the things that's nice about this Burks of L paper is it says, hey, maybe there's a problem with them being accessed. <coughs> so um, so we'll, we'll talk more about the Hift work and some other uh, applications of, uh, of some of these approaches to real world problems. But even if you don't care about you know, dyslexia or quote unquote real world problems at all, these bigger picture questions of you know, are we finding something about representational structure? Are we finding some extra predictive power? Can we learn something beyond what we go from behavior? I think these are questions that it's really useful for imaging studies to ask themselves. And I think it would be useful for you guys to sort of think about those questions in the, the uh, imagined experiments that you're going to present and propose in your projects. So, um, so okay, so uh, see you on Thursday, and uh, if you'd like to meet with me and haven't already, please do, uh, and if I suggest a meeting with you, let's please do that, and um, you know, don't worry about uh, grades. If you answer all your mini questions and hand in the project that sort of does the stuff I'm talking about, then I will be incredibly happy. So, uh, but you know, you can obviously ask me more questions about that. So, uh, thanks very much. And by the way, if anyone would like to meet with me, you know, now I could chat for like, uh, you know, 10, 15 minutes or something. Uh, but uh, Thursday after class would also be a good time. Oh yeah, I haven't I haven't signed that yet. Sorry, but I, but I saw that. Yeah, no, thank you. I will actually I will try and. What? Do you do you need that? I'll try and send it. Okay. Yeah, sure, sure. Okay. Yeah, I might even actually be able to do that now if no one else is trying to. But uh, yeah. Okay.